First Kings chapter number eighteen. First Kings chapter number number eighteen. Everybody here probably knows the story. First Kings chapter number eighteen. The story's about the competition that took place on Mount Carmel. There's a division in the land. There's the king Ahab who's telling everybody that Baal is God. And he's got, sounds like the whole nation convinced that they're to bow down and they're to worship Baal. They're to sacrifice to Baal. They're to give to Baal. They're to serve Baal. Everything that's being done in the nation at this time is revolving around Baal. But there's a prophet by the name of Elijah who shows up and says, you know, this is not about Baal. This is about our great God. Elijah meets Ahab. Ahab looks at Elijah and asks the question, are you the one that's troubling Israel? And Elijah says, to be honest with you, sir, it's not me. It's you. You're the one that's got everybody confused. You're the one that's causing all kinds of ruckus. You're the one that's defying the great God of Israel. You're the one that's defying the great God Jehovah. You're telling everybody that Baal's God. And everybody knows that Baal is just a false God. Elijah says if the problem is anywhere, it's you. Take a look in the mirror, Mr. Ahab. You're the problem. And Elijah said, but I'm tired of hearing about all the stuff that's going on. I mean, remember, it, it's Elijah's made the comments a few times. Hey, God says it ain't going to rain for three and a half years. And guess what? It ain't rained. He said God's promised this and God said that. And it, these things that God has said has happened. So that tells us who's God. But you've got everybody convinced. And that same debate's going on today about who's God. A lot of people think it's Muhammad. A lot of people think it's Allah. A lot of people think it's Buddha. And there's a big confusion today going on in our land about who God is. Is. And I think it's about time some of us as God's young and stood up and issued the challenge. Hey, we're going to put your God to the test. We're going to see if your God's God. And I just told Ahab, hey, I'm tired of all the confusion. I'm tired of all the frustration that's going on. He said, Mr. Ahab, we're going to have a contest. We're going to see who's God. And if who's ever God wins, that's who we're going to serve. So they meet up on Mount Carmel. And they said, divide a lamb. We're going to put that lamb on an altar. And whosoever God sends the fire. That's who we're going to worship. And I mean, it's, it seems like it's a strange request. Ahab the king and Elijah's calling all the shots. This is how we're going to do it. This is how it's going to be. And I can imagine when they get up there on top of that, that mountain, on top of that hill, and they start the contest, so to speak. I can imagine. My, my daddy-in-law is a big boxer, big boxing fan. He loves to sit down, and, and I love it the way boxers announce people. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, in the blue corner, there's King Ahab, there's 450 prophets of Baal. 450 prophets of the groves. There's Ahab. And it seems like everybody else. In the blue corner. And then that announcer turns and says over in the red corner. We'll use red because that's the color of the blood. Over in the red corner. There's just one man. It don't seem like a fair contest. But in this contest, we see, number one, the adversary that Elijah faced. I mean, think about it. It's one man standing all by himself. One man standing for right. Seems like everybody else is standing for wrong. Everybody else is standing for evil. Everybody else is standing for bad. It don't seem like a fair contest. Well, let me throw this out to you. Just because everybody's doing it, that don't make it right. Just because everybody's stepping towards the Sodomites and saying that's okay, it's their choice. Just because everybody's standing seemingly for abortion and it's a woman's choice, they think it's all right. Friend, God says it's not all right. It's still abomination in God's eyes. It's still murder in everybody else. And just because it seems like everybody's doing it, that does not make it right. And it seems like 
another rabbit I'm going to run. It seems like the whole concept is going on in our churches today. Since everybody's doing it, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. Friend, that's not the philosophy to have. Elijah said, it don't matter how many they have over there. It don't matter how many is on that side. It don't matter how many people think they're doing right. I'm not joining up with them. I'm not going to tag team with them. I'm not going to side with them. God calls it sin. It's still sin. If God said it was sin back in the days of Adam and Abraham, it's still sin today. Murder still murder. Sodomy still sodomy. Being a drunkard still being a drunkard. It's all sin in God's eyes. And God says, hey, just because everybody's doing it, that don't make it right. And we don't have to side with it. And Elijah had this attitude. My enemy's over there. My adversary's over there. I'm going to draw a, lay, a line in the sand. And I ain't crossing the line. I'm not going to the side of Ahab. I'm not going to the side of the prophets of Baal, the prophets of the groves. If I have to stand all by myself, I'm going to stand for right. I'm going to stand for God. I need God to see what I need to see. I need for me, for my people to see what I need to see. And that's the fire of God. And if you join up with the opposing side, if you join up with the side of the sin, and if you join up with the side of wrong, God's not going to send the fire. God's not going to send what we need to see in our day. And that's a move of God. A mighty move of God. And we got to stand for what's right. Even if we have to stand all by ourselves, we got to stand. That's right. And if you look at it in God's eyes, the majority was on the side of Elijah because he had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost on his side. Amen. There's 900 plus people standing on the other side. It seems like the adversity. It's all against them. And you face some of that same adversity at work every day. You face a lot of that same adversity wherever it is you go. This world is no friend of the church. This world is no friend of the Bible. This world is no friend of God. Friend, we have to side with right. I mean, even if we have to stand all by ourselves, we have to stand for what's right. And like I said, I made up my mind. I'm going to serve the true and the living God. I mean, all Ahab had to do was say, boy, y'all go over and kill little old Elijah. Kill that one man standing by himself. But Elijah said, ain't no way. I'm going to stand for God. If I have to die, I'm going to die serving God. Elijah said, it doesn't matter my adversity. I'm going to stand for what's right. I'm going to stand for God. Not only the adversity he faced, but Let's look at his attitude of faith. I mean, if, in our text, if you read it, these prophets of Baal start calling out to Baal. And I mean, they're begging Baal to send fire. It gets so drastic in their plea that they start cutting themselves. I mean, they start slicing themselves. They're hollering to the top of their voice, Baal, we need you to show up. And everybody knows Baal's not going to do a thing. Everybody knows Baal's not going to send fire because Baal is a false god. Baal is dead. There's no such thing as the god Baal. And friend, these boys are crying out, hoping that something's going to happen. They start to cut themselves. And Elijah's standing over there watching all this nonsense go on. And he hollers out, hey boys, what's wrong? Is your god asleep? Is he going on vacation? Is he taking a nap? What's wrong with you, God? Maybe you need to cry a little harder. Maybe he's harder here. I mean, Elijah, just that one man, has so much faith and is so full of God, he starts making fun of them boys. Boys, you go ahead and cry all you want to. Your God's not going to answer. You go ahead and beg Baal all you want to. Baal's not going to answer. And Elijah, with all the faith that he has, he's telling these boys, whatever it is you're doing, it's not working. I mean, he's making fun of these boys. It takes a lot of faith to stand for God. I mean, the, the, this world would like nothing more than to come in and, and abolish everything that's going on in here tonight. Mm -hmm. Say, so y'all not bring politics in. No. The reason we're in the shape we're in is because politics haven't been brought out from the pool. That's right. I mean, there's liberals, and then there's real bad liberals. 
And they are calling for civil war. They're calling for action against us radicals, against us fanatics. We're the problem is what they're saying. And yet, they're for all, everything that's wrong. And friend, it takes a lot of faith in the lives of a child of God to stand for God. But let me rest, let me let you know, to rest assured, there's a God in heaven who's looking out for you. There's a God in heaven who will bless your faith, who will give you grace in the time that you need to stand. Friend, there's a God in heaven who appreciates the faithfulness that a servant of God has and God says you're going to stand in this world and go ahead and stand for what's right. Have that attitude of faith. God will deliver. Amen. Contest is in full swing. Elijah's facing adversity. His attitude of faith is just astronomical off the charts. I mean, you think about it. Elijah said, I'm sure Ahab said, Elijah, what in the world are you thinking? You think you're going to win this contest being one man? I mean, how is it that you think you're going to win? And Elijah said, well, Mr. Ahab, it wasn't just a few days ago. The famine was in the land because it hadn't rained for three and a half years. I done said, God said it ain't going to rain. And he said, God told me to go by the brook chair. And he's going to sustain me there. So by faith, I took God at his word. And he said, by faith, God had the ravens, the vultures, come and feed me. He said, Ahab, they might have come to your table and stole your T-bone steak and brought it to me with the baked potato and the salad all included in the, in the meal. I mean, they have. They brought me meat every morning. They brought me meat every night. Every time I got hungry, there was a raven come dropping me something to eat. He said, what makes you think I'm going to back up on God now? What makes you think I'm going to turn my back on God? God was faithful in the famine and God sent me by the brook chair and God took care of me at the brook. No wonder I've got faith in Him. He said, but then the brook dried up. He said, God told me to go to Seraphat. And there was a widow woman who's going to sustain me there. I don't know the scene, how it took place, but Elijah walks right into Zarephath. And I don't know that he walks right into this widow woman. I don't, I don't have a clue. God worked all that out. But this widow woman's picking up sticks. And I'm sure the conversation went something like this. Ma'am, how are you doing? And her answer was bleak. Her answer was dark. And she said, Sir, I'm out here picking up a few sticks. I'm going to make a little fire. I got just a little oil in the cruise, a little meal in the barrel. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make my son and myself a cake. And we're going to die. It's bleak. It's dark. Elijah says, That sounds like a good plan, ma'am, but it's not God's plan. He tells this widow woman, Make me a cake first. Now this lady's done said she just has a little meal and a little oil. I got just enough for a meal, one meal for me and my son. And then it's over for us. And this Baptist preacher, I believe, has come in and said, make me a cake first. <laughs> the nerve of him. The gall. The selfishness. But this woman didn't even argue. She didn't throw up any resistance. She says, oh, the word of the Lord said... I'll make you a cake. And I'm sure as she's taking just that little bit of handful of meal out of that, out of that barrel, she's throwing that meal down in that pan. And I'm sure she grabs that little cruise of oil. And she pours that last, what she thinks, last little drop of oil in that pan and makes that cornbread, that heavenly cornbread. I'm sure she's thinking, well, if this ain't God's will, I'm going to do it. If this ain't what God has intended for us, this is what I'm going to do. I guess we'll just die a little bit sooner. She said, but that man of God said, God doesn't say it. So I'm sure she went back to that barrel. She reached down in that barrel. She grabbed a, another handful of meal. And she went to that cruise and she went to pour thinking it was empty. And there was a little bit more crude oil in that cruise. And then she went, went, went to that barrel again and she grabbed a, just a little bit more meal. Friend, that's just like the grace of God. Every time we go to grab it, there's a lot more meal. Every time we go to grab it, there's a lot more meal. Every time you grab 
And every time you grab, and just like the grace of God, every time you need meal, there it is. It just shows right up again. God knows exactly what he's doing. God has our best interest at heart and at mind. You just keep on going to the barrel. You just keep on going to the cruise. God has what you need. God has your substance. God will sustain you. You just obey God. You just do what the man of God says. And you follow the Bible. And you follow the scripture. I promise you, every time you go to grabbing meal, there'll be meal. Every time you go to pouring oil, there'll be oil. God's grace is sufficient. And friend, God sustained Elijah and Zarephath through the use of a widow woman and her son. God provided the need. He says, Mr. Ahab, what makes you think I'm going to turn my back on God now? God has taken care of me. Preach, I'll buy you a new box of Kleenex when we go to Walmart after a while. We see the adversity he faced. We see his attitude of faith. Number three, let's look at the altars he fixed. An altar is a place where we as God's youngs become abased. We become nothing. We get down low. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto him, unto me. Friend, an altar is not a place where man is exalted. An altar is a place where the sacrifice dies. That's an altar, preacher. An altar is not supposed to be used as a platform. It's not supposed to be used to lift man up. No, an altar is a place where man gets down low and God gets lifted up. But these, these prophets of hell, they're standing up on the altar and they're almost, almost giving the attitude, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look how loud I can cry. Look how loud I can, look how deep I can cut myself. These prophets of hell, they were lifting themselves up on the altar. And after they had their little short time, Elijah said, that's enough, boys. We need to get back to where God's going to meet with us. We need to get back to the place where God's going to manifest himself. And the Bible said that Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord. Let me run this rabbit just a minute. There's some altars at the house that need to be fixed. I'm preaching to me, preacher, just as much as I am anybody in the building right now. Me and my wife have this discussion all the time. See, like when it comes time for family devotions, there's so much stuff the devil throws in the way. It seems like there's so much distraction. So much, I mean, somebody's always already gone to sleep or somebody's too tired or there's a show on or there's a ball game on. Wait till this is over. We'll be done by the time it's over in uh, the second and third overtime. Somebody's done with the sleep or we're too tired. I mean, the devil knows exactly how to distract us from having our altar, family altar at the house. If, it, if you don't have family altar at your house, you're robbing yourself. And I'm preaching to me just as much as I am anybody. If we don't have family altar, our kids are missing out on learning the Bible and learning how to pray and seeing mom and daddy pray and touching God from the house. Friend, our children are missing out. Yeah, that's right. And it, it, it's amazing what kind of stuff gets thrown in our way. But moms and daddies, it's time we made the choice. We're going to fix them altars at the house. That old saying, so goes the Church, so goes the home. So goes the home, so goes the church. That's how it is. We can't have a strong church preacher without a strong home. So goes the church, so goes the nation. It's evident that our churches are struggling. See it the shape our nation's in. It's because moms and daddies and grandmas and grandpas, myself included, we need to fix some altars at the house for the sake of that little one you got sitting in your lap right there. For the sake of these little ones sitting all across this auditorium, we need to fix some altars at the house. They need to hear, our babies need to hear us touch heaven. Our babies need to hear us call out to God. Our babies need to see how much faith we have in God. We need to fix some altars at the house, but not only at the house. We need to fix some altars at the church. Judgment must begin at the house of God. It's amazing, preacher. We hear all the time of churches that have taken these out right here. They say they're offensive. I mean, 
mean, the, the thinking of, of people in church nowadays is if I go down there and pray, people's going to think I'm a sinner. <laughs> ding, 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 you win the prize. <laughs> All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Everybody in the building is sinners. The only difference is there's some saved sinners and there's still some lost sinners. We're all sinners. Apart from the grace of God, we'd already be in hell with our back, but we'd already be feeling the sufferings and the pains of hell. But thank God for His grace who came to where we were and picked us up. And friend, we need to pick some offers at the church. This is a place to refuel. This is a place to get a hold of God. This is a place where revival can start at the altar that needs to be fixed. That's right. These prophets of Baal, they're bragging on themselves on the altar. But Elijah said, boys, you're missing the whole point. The altar is a place where we're not seen. Where God is seen. And Elijah repaired the altar. That was broken down. But then, the last point. We not only saw the adversity he faced. We not only saw his attitude of faith. We not only saw the altars he fixed, but verse number 38 in our Bible. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Then the fire of the Lord fell. We see God's answer by fire. That's the same thing we need to see tonight, church. That's what we need to see. The power of God falling in this place. Elijah's done fix the altar. Miracles happen right here in, in, this, in this chapter. Elijah tells the servants, bring water. Water is a scarce commodity in that day. It's been a famine. I mean, the brooks done dried up. I think the closest water, I believe, to this place, I don't, I don't remember, I, I think it's the Dead Sea to where they are. So either these servants have packed a little bit of water up that mountain, or it just miraculously appears. Only God and the servants know where the water comes from. But Elijah said, boys, y'all pour that water out. Dig a trench around that altar and pour it out. Pour that water on the sacrifice. <coughs> Do it again. Do it again. And they said they poured water till the trench around that altar was filled. This is a scarce commodity, this water. There's a drought going on. There's famine going on. And these boys are wasting seemingly that precious commodity. And Elijah's wanting to show these prophets of Baal, show a way have himself that this is not some kind of trick that I'm mustering up. There's no kind of smoke and mirrors. How many of you in the state of North Carolina knows that water does not burn? And they have saturated the sacrifice. They have saturated the area around the sacrifice. And then Elijah does something strange. The Bible says in that text that I read to you that Elijah himself drew near. Now, I'm no dummy. I believe if I know, preacher, that fire's getting ready to fall right here, I'm moving way over here. <laughs> I had a fella years ago, a few years ago, helping me build a house. The fella had a son who, honest to goodness, I don't know any easier way to put this. Me and my wife thought the boy was demon possessed. 15, 16 year old, just, just seemed like he was demon possessed. Kid had a mouth on him that, that I wanted to, to put my fist through, and I wasn't even his dad. His dad would say something. Preacher, he'd just smart off. He'd say something and, and he'd holler at his daddy and I'm thinking, man, what in the world, you know? 
great, the, the build a great guy. Some days the kid acted normal, but most days he acted just downright evil. And we're on the top of the roof of my house. And from the where we are on the, the very top to the ground is probably, I don't know, it's probably 35 foot. Maybe 30, 35 foot. From the very peak of the roof to the ground. And we're on the very end of the roof. We're putting on the, the shingle caps on the very top. And this boy's cutting the shingle caps. I'm putting them in place. The dad is hitting them with the nail gun. The daddy says something to the boy. And the boy just smarts off to his dad right there. And I mean, where we are, honest to goodness, from right here to probably right here is the ground down. And I'm thinking, had I said that to my daddy, I'd have probably been laying down on the ground. I mean, my daddy probably would have backhanded me so hard, it would have probably knocked all my teeth out, knocked the wind out of me, and I would have probably died before I ever hit the ground. I mean, that's probably about how hard it hit me. And all of a sudden, Kevin, the builder, the dad, gets up, preacher, lays the air gun down, the, the roofing gun down, and he starts walking to the other end of the house. And we're just looking. I'm, I'm just looking, man. What in the world's going on? Where are you going? We got about 10 more caps to put out. Where are you going? And I said, dude, what's going on? We just got this little bit to go. And he said, well, for the comment my son just made to me, I'm expecting God to strike him with lightning. <laughs> and I wanted to be over here so God wouldn't hit me. And I'm thinking, I appreciate you leaving me over here. Thank you very much, sir. And that's about the situation I think should be happening with Elijah. I mean, fire is getting ready to fall. Elijah has so much faith that fire is going to fall. And I mean, he's just drawing himself near, getting right up next to that altar. And the Bible says he starts to pray. He says, God, these people need to see you. They don't need to see me. These people need to see a move of God. God, I've told them that who's ever God sends the fire, that they're going to worship. And God, these people need, listen to what he said, these people need their hearts turned back to you. These people need to turn back to you. They need to see God. They don't need to hear man. They don't need to see man. But these people need to see a move of God. And the Bible, I don't know what happens. They always talk about the banister of heaven and God looking over the banister of heaven. I believe God, maybe somehow another says, I, I hear my servant Elijah calling me. And somebody might have spoken up and said, well God, there was a lot of people calling God just a little while ago. And God said, well them boys wasn't talking to me. They was talking to somebody named Baal. But I hear my servant. I hear one who has a clean heart. I hear one who stood in the face of adversity. And I've heard one who has had the attitude of faith. I've heard one who has fixed the altar. And he said, my servant Elijah needs fire. So God said, I'm just going to send the fire. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Amen. And listen to what it does. The Bible says it consumes the burnt offering. Consumes the wood. Licks up the water. Consumed even the dust that was there. And these prophets of Baal take off running. Having no desire to fall down and worship God, God the great God Jehovah. And Elijah says, you that want to serve God, we're going to do away with them boys. They done went back on their word. But we need the fire to fall. The prayers that we prayed just a little while ago. Was it God? Consume me? Preacher, I, the, the reason I believe Elijah was not consumed when that fire fell is because there was people probably still down at the bottom of that mountain who needed to see some evidence. Who needed to not just hear it. I mean, we hear stories of things happening in church all the time. But just telling about the service we had last night, or telling about the service y'all had yesterday morning, or telling about the service they had, like, people can, can hear it. But it may not be evident. It may not seem real to them that that can possibly happen. So I believe that fire just touched Elijah just a little bit so that we went, he went down the mountain. There was people down there. 
And they said, what happened up there on top of the mountain? And Lot said, well, you probably ain't going to believe it, but I've got evidence that the fire fell, that God sent the fire. And that's exactly what we need in our church today. Folks, we need God to put the fire in us, put the fire on us, so that we can go out and tell this lost and dying world that our Savior is real, that God is real, that everything God says He's going to do, everything God promises He will deliver. We need the fire to fall on us. We need the fire of the Lord to fall. Y'all come on. I want y'all to sing that song again. Send the rain. Send the wind. Send the fire. I, I honestly, preacher, I had a totally different outline in my Bible. And when I knelt down to pray, while these other folk were praying, God said, you need revival. God said, these people don't need to see a preacher. They don't need to see singers. They don't need to see any individual in the building tonight. But what they need is the fire to fall. That's the only thing that's going to help this generation right here. My generation needs to feel the fire, preacher. Needs to see the fire. So my five-year-old, my kid, when she gets old enough to make her own decisions, about if she's going to go to church. About if she's going to serve God. I believe if I show her that God's real. I believe if I show her that God can do what He says He's going to do. She won't have no problem trusting in the same God I trust in. She won't have any problem coming to an old-fashioned Bible preaching church and believe in the same gospel that her daddy believed. Believe in the same miracle that her daddy and her mama believed. Believe in the same miracle that God promised. She won't have any trouble when she comes to understand that God will take her just like she is. Make her a child of the key, fit for heaven. Wash her in his blood and take her to heaven when she dies. She won't have any problem serving God if my generation sees the fire. But that choice is ours, church. Mamas and daddies, the ball's in your court right now. The choice is yours. The attitude you have about church today will affect if they even care about God when they get grown. The same God that set the fire in your life today, He says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. But that desire that Elijah had, we're missing it. The desire that God's going to do exactly what God says He's going to do, we're missing that. And I'm begging God. God, before they lay me out in front of some church somewhere, let my generation see revival. We've seen a spark here. We've seen a spark there. But friend, I want to revive that we'll go ahead 20 years, 40 years down the road. Now say, remember what God did second week of October down there at the church. Remember when God moved in on so and so? They got so full of the Holy Ghost. They got so full of God. They got so full of the fire of God that God done a work and for generation after generation after generation after generation they're still talking about it, what God did. Friend, it's not yesterday's ashes. It's today's sacrifice. It's not yesterday's blessings. It's God's blessings today. God can, He's willing, and He's able to give us revival. But we've got to humble ourselves, pray, that's key, seek His faith, and turn from our wicked ways. The choice is ours. Do we want God to answer us by fire? I'm voting on it. Yes. God, we need you to answer us. We need revival. We're standing all over the building. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. God, I want to thank you for manifesting yourself tonight. God, I thank you for being real in my heart and my life. God, we don't have to live with the ordinary. We don't have to live with the whole hum. No, God, we can live with the supernatural. We can let you work. We can let you have your will. We can let you have your way. And all we can do is stand back and say, God, that is wonderful. As they said in the book of Psalms, everything you do is wonderful in our sight. God, I'm begging right now that you have your way on this congregation. 
God, I'm begging that you touch hearts, you change lives. God, I'm begging if there's sin in the camp, God, I'm begging that right now they make their way down this altar, they confess that sin. God, if they're lost, God, I pray that they turn everything over to you. Ask for forgiveness, repentance and faith. God, you save them before it's everlasting too late. God, right now, I'm begging you to do something unreal. God, I'm begging you to do something that we can walk out the door and only God could have done that. But God, have your way in this invitation. Bless the pastor as he comes. Takes this invitation. God bless you people. We're begging you to send the rain. God, have your way in Christ's name. Amen. The pastor's coming. He's going to take this invitation. They're going to sing this song. If you need to come, you come right now. Well, we've heard the word. You know, in that story, Elijah came to the people. He said, how long will you halt between the two? If Baal be God, you serve Baal. But if my God be God, you serve Him. But you know what the saddest part of that verse is? Bible says, God, the people answered not a word. They just stood there. They just stood there. They just lied to all by himself, ready for revival, ready for the fire to come down. You know what they were doing? They were waiting to see how that thing would turn out. What's the best for me? I wonder if that's what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to stand there. What, had a, what opportunity they had. What a choice they had to make. They had to make a choice. You hear the word of God, you know you make a choice. Every time you hear it, you say, well, I didn't make no choice. That's right, you did. And <laughs> just by not doing anything, you made a choice. They said not a word. No one stood up. No one stood with Elijah. No one prayed. No one begged God to come down and bring the fire. Listen, as they sing, let's not be like the people of that day. They just stood there when they could have done something. When they could have called on God. They could have seen God do something in their life. They just stood there. Let's, let's, let's come and let's see what God will do. I believe He's a, a, a good God and wants to do good things for us. You come. They sing. You come. Whatever you need. If you need Jesus, you come. You come right now.